Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Max. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, it is good to be here. Jerry, thank you so much for having me. Um, all right. It is not a name for a home group. Okay. I don't know if I want to get in the full story because it might be a little boring. I live in Chicago. The name of my home group is the California group. It started by a guy who went to California, found the Pacific group, moved back here to become a radio DJ, found out that there was already a group called the Pacific group. But at that Pacific group, you didn't have to wear a coat and tie to speak. So it made him really angry. So he started the California group. And uh, I actually, we will uh, discuss that gentleman later on. <laughs> um, but I am happy to be here. I got to tell you, I, I get the sensation that, you know, especially in Chicago, we're getting a little closer and closer to being back together uh, in, in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and being around each other. And I'm really looking forward to that. And full disclosure, because, you know, we're supposed to be honest with one another. I remember, like it was yesterday, when I got the phone call, hey, there's some sickness going around. For some reason, they want to close the church. And I was like, great. I can finally get some stuff done. You know, I, I don't have to go to these meetings all the time. And one week turned into two weeks, and two weeks turned into three weeks, and then three weeks there was this buzz of people talking about Zoom. And I, you know, I'm not super tech savvy, but I jumped in with like both teeth. I could not take any more of myself at that point. So I am thankful for Zoom. You know, um, so when Jerry asked me to do this, we have you get all this Zoom codes passwords and then you add a time change on that for someone who's almost 50 i spent like the last hour well one for some reason i picked the hottest spot in my apartment to give this talk i don't know why two i'm like wait am i central time zone are they eastern time zone and when you're my age you never think to just google something i always just sit around and try to is there a central pacific time zone western and, you know, finally I got it right. But then you add the other curveball, show up 15 minutes early. I'm like, wait a minute. Is that 40? Wait, that's 45 minus whatever. And anyway, so it's a miracle I made it here. <laughs> <laughs> On time and, and ready to go. My sobriety date is August 17th, 1991. Um, you know, if you're new here tonight and old, middle of the road, struggling in any capacity, especially with the, the spirituality part of this program, I'd encourage you to just please stay with us. Um, you know, when I, when I say my sobriety date and then bring, immediately bring up the spirituality part, is that that was my first piece of proof that there's something else besides me. So, you know, we got a lot of people talk about higher powers, and I'm just generally a non-believer. I'm a non-believer in anything. I have to see it work. For You can talk to me all you want. If I don't see it, I don't believe it. So that sobriety date, that was one of the first things that, that made me say, okay, there might be something here. Because when I came out of a blackout that morning, on my checklist of things to do, one of them was not join AA. It wasn't in the rotation, find more money, find my shirt, find out what happened. That was like the checklist of what was going on. Joining Alcoholics Anonymous was not in that checklist. So that was the first tangible thing that I could see of, you know, a power greater than myself or a force that is going to, you know, work for me. And it was that force that put me here because none of this was my decision. You know, I kind of literally just went along for the ride. Um, so I would encourage you if you're if you're struggling with that aspect of of what we're talking about, you know, just stay. 
That's all I ask you to do is stay. Um, you know, our, uh, I don't want to misquote it. It's one of our founders. It's Bill or Bob. I'm going to take a long shot and assume it's Bill because everybody quotes Bill a lot. Uh, in his story, he talks about he had the sensation that he arrived when he first drank. And I related to that. But I had a sensation of I feel better. You know, that the first time I drank, um, that was the first time I felt comfortable my whole life. I, I honestly, not to be over dramatic, I didn't know that you could feel good until I had that experience. I had never felt comfortable. I had never felt fearless. I had never felt free of shame. Um, never, you know, didn't know what it was like to not feel insecure, nervous. I didn't know what it was like to not have that. And the first time I drank, I didn't know that that was going to happen to me. I, we were, Irish kids, we all grew up in the same neighborhood. It was bound to happen at some point. But I had no idea that there was going to be this other side to that. It was just something you did. You watched the adults do it. And then when you were an early teenager, you got your chance. And that's exactly what happened to me. But like I said, I didn't know there was this backside to it. I had never felt that good before in my entire life. Um, you know, and I've been around AA for a long time and listened to a lot of stories. And I will tell you, um, alcohol for me was not something that brought me down. It was not something I, I didn't have this amazing life going on. And then it slowly started to trickle down because I drank, you know, I had garbage and alcohol, like helped me like free me from that. And so, you know, on one hand, I'm incredibly thankful for the the actual alcohol it was a lot of fun it is something that worked and i didn't know i was searching if you will for something that would work like that and you know it like all of us i overdid it <laughs> i overshot the mark it's really that simple consequences started to mount uh you know early younger guy just doing some ridiculous stuff because I was intoxicated that no one really paid attention to. It was no big deal. You get a little older, a couple of car wrecks, you know, hey, maybe there's something wrong with this kid. Uh, I'm out of high school. You know, I was expelled. Uh, got a couple, of, you know, I worked at a car wash, uh, all kinds of odd jobs and just kind of bounced around and drank and experienced consequences and was never able to put the two together, you know? And I do remember having these moments where I would be in a situation and that situation usually involved some sort of jail or a hospital and was able to, you know, put together, all right, there's something wrong here, but please, God, don't let it be alcohol. I, I it, It's not like I, I need it, but I, I know that I can't do reality. I cannot do, you know, that, that thing that people have, I can't do that. I don't know how they do that. You know, and this is my only, my only savior from that. And uh, it was the alcohol. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I lost that bet with the Lord. And it went on. And I ended up uh, a, a couple of times in treatment and I was in treatment one time and, you know, I toggled between, you know, do I really need this? Is it really that serious? Um, you know, it, it was just a lot to take in and they, they brought us, uh, a guy would come pick us up and they, they would bring us to an, from the treatment center to an actual uh, meeting Alcoholics Anonymous. And the very last guy, I remember like it was yesterday, the very last guy who commented, I related to so much that it made me uncomfortable. It actually made me nervous. It, the, the things he was talking about were things I was experiencing, but I wasn't saying anything to anybody. It was just one of those, you know, he, basically to paraphrase what he said, that he would come to immediately, you know, deal with all the guilt and remorse of the blown money, the not being able to put his foot down, the continually crossing the line of, you know, I'm not, I'm not staying out that late. I'm not doing this again. 
and you know, as the day would go on, all that would would kind of just float away, would wash away, and he wouldn't be able to remember the the consequences. And then there was always that barter system. Well, I'm not I, I'm not going to get drunk drunk. You know, I'll just I'll just have a couple tonight. I'm not going to get like last night. I really like I wanted to do that, but tonight I'm just going to have a couple. And I totally related to that. And I thought at that time, I'm like, wait, if you relate to this guy and this guy is saying he's an alcoholic, like the jig might be up. And I didn't stop drinking at that moment, but I know for sure at that moment, a member of Alcoholics Anonymous ruined my drinking moving forward. I no longer drank freely with the thought of woe is me. You know, I drew the crummy card in life because when I, when I, didn't go to treatment right i had no idea that there was another side to this i had no idea that people could get better i just didn't know no one <clears throat> in my family ever quit drinking none of my neighbors cousins i had no idea uh what you guys did it actually existed and now i know that there's a solution to this fast forward a couple of years um <clears throat> so that would be like august the 16th of 91 I was in an alley. I came out of an alley uh, after I had gotten the crap kicked out of me. For some reason, I didn't have a shirt on, which was kind of weird. And I had 87 cents and a half-smoked cigarette on me. That was all the possessions I had on me. <clears throat> and I remember walking, trying to find a pay phone, um, you know, just to continue on with what I was doing. The moment of clarity for me is very small. It, it was something that I wasn't ready for. I I just sat on this curb, and uh, the thought that occurred to me was, well, how bad is AA going to be? What's the, what's the worst thing that could happen to you if, if you try uh, this not drinking lifestyle for a while? And that's kind of what happened. I, I went to a, a treatment center. Uh, from there, I went. To, I moved to the north side, and I was in a halfway house. And when I was in the halfway house, they said, you got to get a home group, you got to get a sponsor, and you got to work the steps. And I immediately did none of those. Uh, you know, I was still under the impression that you could take what, that suggestion take what you want and leave the rest. I took very little and left most uh, of what, you know, was important. And, you know, um, I was that guy, that guy that drives everybody crazy, never on time to the meeting, uh, disruptive, always left before the Lord's prayer. And at, at that time, I was under the impression that this is very simple math. Okay. I'm an alcoholic. I remove alcohol. The problem should be solved. It doesn't get any easier than that. And that's the mindset <clears throat> I had at that time. And I continued on. Uh, I did not drink at things at the very base level got better. You know, uh, I enjoyed being sober. I, it was, you know, such a new experience to taste fruit and to take showers and to not worry about getting arrested. You know, it had been a really long time since I experienced any of this stuff. So at the very base level, I was like, yeah, this, this AA thing was good, but I was doing nothing to solve the alcohol problem. You know, and like I said, I, I just assumed that since I was an alcoholic, I removed the alcohol, the problem solved. And I don't know, for some reason, it was around my third year of, of what you know type of sobriety I had, I just said, you know what, I'm I'm not going tonight. Yeah, I just uh, whatever the reason was, I, I'm sure I'll find something else to do, or you know, kind of AA is kind of holding me back from living the life I'm supposed to live. They they ask a lot of my time, and I just didn't go. And you know, one night of not going turned into a couple weeks couple weeks turned into four months, four months turned into two years, two years turned into three years. And what I, what had happened to me was I lost my mind. I really, 
um, had no idea what was wrong with me, you know, and I, in my, my life, my sober life almost mirrored my drinking life, just minus the relief of alcohol. The consequences were the same. The, the, the madness between the ears was the same, uh, lost multiple jobs. You know, I was escorted off the bus by the Chicago police. I, you know, never had any money. It was just this constant rotation of currency exchanges, loans, you know, just a mess, a phone in my sister's name. This person's got to sign a lease for me. everything was just a mess. And it was just, that was exactly how my drinking life was. And I could not figure out for the life of me, how I got into this place. And I finally threw in the towel, went to this meeting, and I, just, I said, you know, I've done everything that you people ask other than work the steps, get a sponsor, and go to meetings. Other than that, I've done everything that you ask. You know, why is my life so crazy? I was really at the, the jumping off point, you know, that they talk about in our book. And something in me said, you know, if you drink again, you're going to have some relief, but you're also you're still going to have all these problems. And now, on top of the fact that, and now you're drunk, your problems aren't going to go away. And you know, I just set off on an absolutely miserable existence. Everything made me angry. Everything was a conspiracy against me. Um, you know, just completely self-will run riot across the board from the time I woke up to the time I went to bed. And where I worked at the time, I used to work at the Chicago Board of Trade, and there was a guy there um, who was absolutely insane, and I knew he was sober. And, you know, he's just like myself, he was just completely out of his mind. And uh, we were neighbors, so I would, you know, would see him on the bus. Sometimes we would split a cab. And just out of the blue, one day, he was completely different. Uh, I can't explain it other than he was the exact opposite of how I had known him. And he said, he started, well, I started going back to meetings. I, I go to this meeting called the California Group. You want to come by and check it out? Now, at this point, I hadn't been um, to a meeting now at close to like the three-year marker, uh, just not drinking. That's all I was doing. And I didn't have another option. You know, I guess kind of that's the nice thing about being at bottom is the removal of your options. And I said, yeah, I'll go, you know, I'll go, I'll check it out because I am, you know, I'm thinking about jumping in front of a bus. I'm thinking about drinking again. And I can't figure out how life is so bad, especially because I don't drink. And um, I went there and it was a buzz of activity. And if you're in a miserable place and you run into happy people, that is like, oh man, like I wanted to put my face through glass Everybody in there was happy, and it was so irritating. But at the same time, it was also very attractive. And I'd never seen a meeting like this before, you know, and there's nothing wrong with them. Just the places I was going to, if the meeting started at 8, the guy showed up at 7.59 to open the door. You know, people, uh, again, I don't know why I knock them, but it was just there was zero structure whatsoever. And this place... It was like a production, a team of people setting up chairs, this coffee crew and, you know, people running around. I, I don't know. They might have they might have walkie talkies. I'm not sure. I don't remember. But they had greeters. They had food. They had people in my face to some degree. Who are you? How long have you been sober? Welcome. We're here. at the, And they would rattle off the dates. Do you need literature? Do you need a ride home? I was like, whoa everybody just like first of all i'm three years sober so everybody just relax okay like i i got a good grasp of what's going on here you know and i understand we're supposed to get out of ourselves and greet the newcomer but i'm not new i'm crazy but i'm not new and <laughs> the, that was like the the mindset but i never seen anything like this 
And, you know, as much as I resisted and punched holes in it and was like, absolutely not, there was also this, oh my God, like what, I, whatever they're doing, I know is working. Because like I told you in the beginning, I saw it. Wasn't anybody just rattling off pages at random in the big book? Quotes from the 24 hour a day, you know, put the, no one's going, Hey, put the plug in the jug. No one's saying, Hey, just think, think, think people are commenting. They're getting up to this podium and they're going, this is how it is working in my life. I had this situation. These are the actions I took. Now I'm in this solution. And it like visibly looked like that person was telling the truth. And, you know, I, I, I said, yeah, absolutely not. I'm not doing it. These people are way too healthy. There's just way too, they're just too into it. You know, they made it look creepy. And uh, they were very cult-like for trying to save lives. And <laughs> But while I was there, there was a guy there that I briefly met. I'd never seen this guy before in my life. And it's kind of like anything else in your life. You know, when you never see something, then you see it one time. And now I see it everywhere. I had never seen this guy before in my adult life, met him for about 11 seconds, hated every fiber of his being. He's like six foot eight, you know, really into being sober, just kind of happy about it. Uh, and yeah, I just couldn't stand him. And he worked literally right across the street from where I worked. And now I see him every day, every day I see him. And this is, uh, I don't know the year. So this was like 97-ish, if you will. So it was kind of before the cell phones were around, but it was kind of before that. So if you didn't have a cell phone on you, you couldn't fake like a conversation. When, like, so if you saw someone, you either had to run or talk to them. Those were like your only two options. And I saw this guy every day. And every day he would ask me the, the same things. I don't know how you live with yourself. How's the isolation chamber? If you ever want to get out of yourself, you can come to our meeting. And he would ask me this stuff all the time. So finally, you know, I called him. I set up this arrangement. We're going to meet. And I was going to rattle off, you know, just all the things I couldn't do in AA to get better. And he listened for a couple minutes. He's like, listen, I got to tell you, I really think you should start mopping this floor. That was like one of his first suggestions. <laughs> now I already couldn't stand this guy because he's really tall. And I'm like, I don't mop. You know, I, like I said, I've been around three years, three, three year people don't mop. So I wasn't going to do that. And, you know, he just kept suggesting it and suggesting it. So finally I came back. Again, the nice thing about being at bottom, my experience of being in bottoms is you are out of options. I was out of options. Uh, that was the very first thing I did for my home group was mop the floor. We used to mop the floor before they set up chairs and after. I, you know, I don't know why. Is you know one of those things I don't understand, but is imperative that I do. And we started mopping. What happened to me, what I experienced at that first meeting is then after I mopped, they, they would greet and you could have a cookie. And, you know, like I said, people were making coffee. Is uh, I got a ride home that night from a, a guy that went to the meeting. And that was the first time that I was ever out of myself. So that was the first time I experienced, uh, I, I don't want to say peace of mind, but that was the first time I wasn't completely consumed with my thoughts, my consequences. How is this going to affect me? How does, you know, what's the easiest route for me? I wasn't consumed with that stuff. And I thought to myself, you know, it, it feels good to feel better. This might be um, the way here. You know, I had spent so long completely suffering that I'm like, you know what, maybe what they're doing, just give it a shot. Just give it another. And that's slowly how these changes started. Now, when I got here, I had no interest in reading the big book. I was, you know, to me, my philosophy pretty much was anything but the steps. I'll do anything to get better but the steps. You know, if you have something else for me, 
there's got to be a different level to this for people who are really smart. You know, the, the big book, all that stuff just seemed too simple. And what had started to happen was by, by getting involved in this home group, um, you know, what I didn't know at the time was it was starting to lay a foundation to fill that void of the doubt, the low self-esteem, the lack of dignity, the shame, the, all that stuff we live with that we drink over, that I was starting to, to lay a foundation of, of filling that with things that, you know, I did not understand. And I, again, if you're new or struggling, I want to encourage you, you don't have to understand this. The understanding what we do and why we're doing it is not a requirement, you know, um, and probably better off for having lack of understanding. You know, I, I just follow suit. So these people, like I said, what they were doing, they seem to look a lot better than I felt, pure and simple. And that's, I started doing the work. And what we have here, what I'm a huge fan of, Alcoholics Anonymous, is that I I would imagine it's some form of unconditional love. You know, there were people at this meeting, they didn't know me from Adam, but knew I was suffering. And it's that what we do for each other, like I, you know, I don't know a lot of you guys, but I will do anything I can to help you not suffer. It's pure, you know, it's really that simple. And, you know, it was a slow climb out, just a little bit on top of a little bit, on top of a little bit, on top of, and before you knew it, I wasn't as crazy. Then we got into the big book. Then I started to work the steps. It was at that point, you know, I was reading this stuff, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, you know, he will never control or enjoy his drink. I was like, oh, yes, that, that is me. Then I realized I have the disease of alcoholism. doesn't matter if you take it out of my system or not. I have to find a solution to live in this world without alcohol, you know, and that way is the way of Alcoholics Anonymous, what they tell us to do in the steps, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It, you know, if you just sat me down when I was new and just started rattling this stuff off that this is what we're going, I'm not going to, it wasn't going to take, you know, I just could not comprehend. It wasn't until I started getting involved in the home group that I started to understand and was able to, to put together like, oh, okay, this is why we're doing this. This is why, you know, I've quit everything in my life before I started. This is why I have a hard time with commitments, all this stuff was as a result of doing some of the footwork first. And, you know, we have this thing here where we, it's almost to the extent where we protect one another. You know, the, the home group for me, it was my life raft. You know, I was in trouble. I was in trouble. I was, you know, completely dry and totally out of my mind. And, zero idea that there was a solution to any of that. No clue. You know, I would tell people in my miserable manic states, I tried AA. They're crazy. It doesn't work. I mean, it works if you want to stop drinking, but I can't, you know, look at my life. I mean, it's the electric sound. I have no money losing job. It's just like nonstop craziness. It's like the, I was like, I had the anti-promises. You know, it's like the way I'm like, when am I going into the rocket in the fourth dimension? I honestly thought this would work by osmosis. If you just sat somewhere for an hour, at some point it would wash off on you and then you would go do better. I was having the exact opposite, you know, until I ran into these people that showed me this is how you do it. Step by step, lock, stock and barrel. No, you know, it doesn't need your interpretation. It doesn't need your understanding. Boom, boom, right, left, right, left, one, two, three, four. (laughs) It really is that easy. And as a result of that, doing things I did not understand, doing things I did not want to do, I have the exact opposite of what I came in here with, the exact opposite. Now, I always thought we were just here to, you know, to not drink. Which, to some extent, yes, that is exactly what we are doing. I had no idea, though, the replacement for that 
was going to be dignity, self-respect, you know, sometimes courage, not all the time. I definitely fake my way through adulthood. Just don't tell anybody, but it's a complete facade. <laughs> I'll, you know what I know what to do in the morning? I'm like, you know what? You should probably go to work. That's about the extent uh, of my knowledge of, of how to live life. Uh, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. You know, wait, I mean, maybe that answer will come to me. I don't know. But we do these things that I did not understand. And all that garbage that I came in with was replaced with the exact opposite. And, you know, I did not want that to happen. I, that was not the plan. And earlier when uh, I started this talk, I, it was kind of talking about how I came to believe in a, a power greater than myself. One was that that day, uh, it, you know, in August of 91, I didn't pick to join this. It, was, it wasn't in, in, the, in, the, in the plans. Two, the things we do to get better, I would never pick. Is, I'm telling you. So if you ask me, hey, you know, how are you going to get better? I'm never going to tell you. Pay back everybody you owe. <laughs> I'm just not going to say it. Work harder than anybody. I'm never going to give out these suggestions. Like it never registers with me. So that's how I know that that there's a thing here that we find here is that it's much better. And I'll finish with this, you know, uh, I, I did, you know, sadly, I took some of what we had for granted. Now, there's things in my life that, you know, I'm an alcoholic. I'm just naturally going to take for granted. It's a given. Sight, walking, food, all that stuff I just take for granted. But the stuff with the fellowship and being a part of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, sadly, I, I must have been on autopilot or just assumed, you know, it will always be here for me. And, um, you know, when this thing, when we were in the throes of, of COVID in the May and April of last year and the isolation and, you know, I could not, I'm like, I will get back. We will get back together. I could not wait, you know, um, and my hope is that I never take that for granted again. The fellowship, the going for coffee when you don't want to, the, the meeting people for the first time, the greeter lines, you know, watching someone take a cake. I hope I never take that stuff for granted again. And, you know, I'm so looking forward uh, to getting back. And, and hopefully, you know, someday we meet in person. And hopefully someone got something out of what we talked about tonight. And thanks again for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.